First up, I want to be explicitly clear that I do not advocate for violence. Don't do so in the comments either. Turn the other cheek when you get beat with the baton. Be clear? Cool. I just want to make a video to help you world build fictional conflict between your fictional movements and the fictional governments they oppose, and particularly the challenges they'll face if their strategy is one of non-violence. I'm referencing theory, history, and real-life movements, but it's all to supplement your world building realism and stimulate your imagination. Cool? Let's begin. Nonviolence has always held a venerated position in a modern society. Nonviolent resistance is the practice of achieving, or attempting to achieve, social change while being nonviolent. Tactics include symbolic protest, civil disobedience, vigils, protest art, community education, lobbying, boycotts, and general strikes. Figures like Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. are celebrated today for their peaceful advocacy for civil rights thoroughly whitewashing their complex movements and legacies in order to hold them up as instruction manuals for the right way for oppressed peoples to resist. I'll get to both of them in a moment. Conservatives and liberals especially really appear to hate violence, yet they spend a lot of energy trying to convince the oppressed, not the oppressor, that violence is wrong and ineffective. As Dr. King rightfully said, the white moderate prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. So they'll stand firm with the law and order of the oppressor because they think they can bring about freedom and stability without threatening the system in any way. They think the world can be made better without actually removing the system that got us here. The status quo must be maintained. What's interesting is that if you ask different advocates of nonviolence to outline violence as a concept, you're going to get different answers. Violence is pretty ambiguous and very easy to manipulate, especially in the hands of the media and the state. It's vague to the point of uselessness, because people are just going to keep bending and twisting it however they want to morally justify or condemn the actions they've already decided are acceptable or unacceptable. Violence is a category that we choose to place or not place a variety of actions and situations. We don't count driving a car as violence, even though it kills nearly 1.5 million people every year. Structural harm, the one condoned and upheld by the state, goes unnoticed every day. Blood oils this machine, yet violence is a euphemism for things that threaten the ruling class and their illusion of peace. A peace that obscures class struggle, patriarchy, colonialism, evictions, hunger, and police brutality. Striking workers and tenants are violent. Cops and landlords aren't. And so it goes. Today I'm borrowing heavily from the work of Peter Kelderloos, particularly the failure of nonviolence and how nonviolence protects the state. Read both yourself for a more in-depth study. They can really help with your world building and their Andrewism reading list essentials. But anyway, let's talk about the problems with nonviolence. Nonviolence is ineffective. Let's examine the movements of two of the most popular nonviolent activists of world history, Gandhi and MLK. In both cases, upon further examination, you'll see that history is heavily manipulated to paint all victories for humanity as a result of uniform dedication to pacifism rather than the reality of diverse tactics used in conjunction. In the fight for Indian independence from British rule, the common narrative is that Gandhi built a massive, non-violent movement that engaged in protest, hunger strikes, and civil disobedience to jam up the gears of British imperialism. Sure, there may have been a massacre here and there, and perhaps one or two riots, but the Indian independence movement is an exemplar of peace. Right? Wrong. British colonial power was severely weakened by both world wars, plus the militant struggles of Arabs and Jews in Palestine. Violence is what weakened the empire, and the fear of violence from the Indians and other colonial holdings was a major factor that led to the acceleration of independence from colonial rule. And while Gandhi's resistance movement was of importance, it was only one of several forms of popular resistance. Revolutionaries like Chandra Sekhar Azad and Bhagat Singh won mass support for their armed struggle against British, Indian, and international capitalism. And they, among others, are still admired in India today. While Gandhi was well respected, he actually lost a lot of support for his leadership when he tried to call off the movement after the 1922 riot. So much so that when he was arrested by the British afterwards, 
Nobody even protested. History remembers Gandhi above all the others because he was palatable, not because he represented all of India's feelings at the time. Plus, we have to question whether independence was really a victory, in India as in other colonized nations. The British had a heavy hand in dictating what independence would look like for India. They partitioned India and Pakistan, fanned the flames of religious and ethnic tensions, and ensured dependence and foreign aid for decades to come. Poverty and inequality abound as foreign corporations continue to pillage India, now with the help of some Indian corporations too. India wasn't liberated, it was moved from direct colonial to neo-colonial rule. What about the civil rights movement in the US? Didn't MLK Jr. single-handedly end racism with just a march? Well, no. The movement was neither a complete success, nor was it non-violent. It did technically end legal segregation and expand the black middle class, but the movement was never just about those things. The movement sought complete political and economic equality, and many wanted black liberation in a variety of forms. But they didn't really get equality or liberation. Today, black folks in the US still face low average incomes, lower rates of homeownership, poor healthcare and health, lower access to housing, and higher rates of voter disenfranchisement. Other people of color, particularly immigrants, face abuse, deportation, denial of social services, and poor labor conditions. Muslims face discrimination and hate crimes in a post-9-11 world, while native folks continue to be oppressed by the state. MLK Jr.'s SCLC might have had swing, but the Black Panther Party's militant resistance was overwhelmingly popular, especially among the most disenfranchised black population. In 1970, 43% of African Americans identified their views with the BPP, while 66% took pride in the BPP's activities. And the Panthers were just one manifestation of a long history of the armed resistance of African Americans. And both the revolutionary and non-violent segments of the movement were deeply intertwined, despite some bad blood fomented by the state. Again and again, civil disobedience was easily consumed by the government's bottomless jails. In Albany, Georgia in 1961, Months of nonviolence failed the people, while in 1962 it took riots against the racist police to force them to finally retreat. In Birmingham, Alabama in 1963, while the KKK continued to bomb black families in their homes, Dr. King's nonviolent march landed him in jail in April, where he wrote his famous letter from Birmingham jail. He argued that people have a moral responsibility to break the law and take direct action rather than waiting for justice. In May of the same year, in the face of continued police violence, over 3,000 black people fought back, pelting rocks and bottles at the armed police. After those riots, the city of Birmingham finally agreed to desegregate downtown stores. Days later, after more Klan bombings and the deaths of several black children, thousands of black folks rose up to riot once again, seizing nine blocks, destroying police cars, injuring cops, and burning white businesses. Exactly one month and one day later, President Kennedy was calling for Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act. It took a demonstration of our might, of non-peace, for the white power structure to negotiate with the peaceful. And we can see the results of that negotiation today, in a still racially stratified American society. As for Dr. King, after the passing of the Civil Rights Act, he continued to organize against racism in America, but he also turned his attention to poverty as a whole organizing a failed multiracial campaign for UBI. He was assassinated a year later. So we've seen in both India and the US that nonviolence alone was insufficient, whereas the diversity of tactics got swift results. Interesting. Nonviolence is racist. To embrace nonviolence as a sole path of resistance is pretty privileged and pretty closely tied with the white middle class and middle classes all over the world. Violence exists. Just because it's hidden from suburbia doesn't mean it isn't ongoing. Privileged folks don't have the right to lecture the oppressed on the right way to protest. Brutalized people of color shouldn't have to sit around and wait until enough white folks change their mind. Must the imperialized of Africa, Latin America, the Middle East and Asia suffer patiently while white folks write to their congressmen? The Martin Luther King Jr. that the white middle class so loves is not the Martin Luther King Jr. that actually existed. They killed him and co-opted him, selectively quoting and misquoting, ignoring his critiques of white folks, and erasing his contemporaries. That's how you end up with arrogant white folks in the comment section of his daughter Bernice's tweets, 
lecturing her about her own father during the BLM protests she supported last year. Or how you have white folks using him to condemn the few riots that took place, while he himself described riots as the language of the unheard. He's become a comfortable cash cow of non-violent activism that white folks can feel good about associating themselves with. It's pretty racist to take an anti-racist black man and turn him into a bludgeon you can use against black folks. White activists attempt to pacify and control the oppressed, especially through disarmament. The KKK did the same thing after the Civil War. They'd work with the police to steal weapons from black folks whenever they could. When Reagan was governor, he passed gun control legislation in California to disallow the open carry of loaded firearms, all because the Black Panther Party was gaining prominence. And today, although the Klan has fallen back a bit, the police have grown their armories and their violence. But white pacifists have kept urging people of color to remain unarmed and have largely stood by, historically and today, while black, brown, and red liberation movements have been assaulted by the state. Worse yet, they blame the revolutionaries for their own repression and claim the past failure of some revolutionaries proves the ineffectiveness of their often armed tactics. Yet ask yourself when writing your stories, who has the privilege to choose violence? Who is subject to violence whether they want it or not? Our people of color have used non-violence is usually been in order to compromise with the white power structures in order to avoid even more extreme repression. But that's just it. Compromise, not liberation. The structure remains. Nonviolence is statist. Nonviolence reinforces the legitimacy of the state's monopoly on violence. The state, as defined by Malatesta, is the sum total of the political, legislative, judiciary, military, and financial institutions through which the management of their own affairs, the control over their personal behavior, the responsibility for their personal safety are taken away from the people and entrusted to others who, by usurpation or delegation, are vested with the power to make laws for everything and everybody and to oblige the people to observe them, if need be, by the use of collective force. States are centralized entities that protect and reinforce capitalism, neocolonialism, patriarchy, and white supremacy. Any struggle against real oppression necessitates a struggle against the state, which I'll call the big bad of your fictional world. If your revolutionary characters want liberation, they'll need to get rid of the big bad first. But pacifists will attempt to pacify opposition. Their obsession with nonviolence leads to them working with and for the police, the big bad's foot soldiers, and the media, the big bad's propagandists. I'll explain the media aspect of things in the next section. In the late 20th century, the police in the US began to change their tactics. Rather than focusing on violent crackdowns of riots, which would often add more fuel to the flame and damage the illusion of democracy, the police decided to work with non-violent activists to improve their image and control the crowd. Protest leaders would get government permits, police themselves, and stay in touch with the actual police. As long as the revolutionaries continue to allow pacifists and police to collaborate, they're not going to make progress. Pacifists claim that the big bad actually wants activists to use violence so they can crack down on them. In fact, they often claim that anyone urging militancy is working for the government. While it is true that the US government especially has used infiltrators to destroy activist groups from the inside, it's important to note that it only does so if it feels like it can contain the violence. Basically, the government tries to encourage movements to act prematurely. But for the most part, authorities prefer non-violence. They'll spy on non-violent movements for sure and will definitely beat up on them for funsies, but they're not going to try to eliminate these groups. They'd rather just direct them into peaceful, legal, and ineffective channels of resistance. General Frank Kitson, an influential British military, police, and social control theoretician, broke social disturbances down to three stages. Preparation, non-violence, and insurgency. States try to keep movements within those first two stages because the first two are rarely easy to manage. Stage three, though, is dangerous and difficult. But ultimately, with enough dedication, far more effective. Pacifists think that nonviolence is more effective because that way the state has no excuse to repress them. But they have things mixed up. Governments aren't ruled by public opinion. Public opinion is largely ruled by the government. The only antibody for the popularity of government repression is a movement having legitimacy in the eyes of the public, which has little to do with whether they use violence or non-violence. 
The Irish Republican Army enjoyed support despite their militancy, especially while the British tried to repress them. Stage 3, Insurgency, is also far more effective because, unlike the previous two stages, it actually poses a threat and acts fully independently of the Big Bad's interests. Of course, they need to create a broad culture of resistance to build their legitimacy, but at least they don't mistakenly believe that the power of love or some sit-in is going to actually change things. Building strong popular support for militant struggle against the Big Bad is a good indication of the closeness of success. Meanwhile, rolling over in advance to the activism that actually poses a threat is a confirmation of inevitable failure. When the goals of a movement are threatening and achievable, and it enjoys popular support, the Big Bad will do whatever it takes to destroy the movement, with any means at its disposal, regardless of the tactics advocated. At least militants would be better prepared for that. Pacifists have no defense against uncompromising extermination. Over the past two centuries in the US, hundreds of union organizers, anarchists, and Marxists were murdered in their anti-capitalist struggle. From the Italian immigrant anarchists, to the IWW, to the American Indian Movement, to the Black Panther Party. Millions of dollars were poured into the thousands of FBI and police operations of the Quintal Pro era in order to neutralize the threats. The Big Bad teaches non-violence so that the masses will accept its monopoly on violence and lose their ability to wield direct action. Pacifists display a kind of learned helplessness, or maybe bootlicking, signaling to the Big Bad they're not trying to threaten it or anything, that the state is definitely still the big boy on campus. And as a bonus, the state gets to look like a good democracy that definitely isn't elitist or authoritarian by allowing limited peaceful protests with weak source criticism that doesn't actually threaten it. It's like that cute picture of the flower stuck in the barrel of the gun. The gun can still fire. At the protests against the 2004 RNC convention in New York, Mayor Bloomberg gave special buttons to all the good peaceful activists, which meant he got political points and they got special discounts at Broadway, hotels, museums, and restaurants. The anti-RNC protests became a cute little parade of students and Democrats, holding funny signs and drinking craft beers, I'm sure. Bloomberg's administration encouraged the peaceful folks to move along on the pre-approved protest route while the bad protesters got beat and arrested. Remember that a government can take away rights whenever it wants to. That's the nature of rights. They are made up. And as we've seen again and again, free speech can easily be suppressed with a curfew. It's only free as long as it isn't a threat. Modern governments recognize the inevitability of conflict, so they've developed ways to manage conflict. Not by counterinsurgency warfare, which they know how to do, but by keeping activists naive, polite, and easy to control. They've gotten really good at maintaining the illusion of social peace, where a society of domination and exploitation definitely isn't that, and anyone who says otherwise is just a troublemaker. Progressive Democrats, for example, while facilitating fraternity between themselves and pacifists, divide them with the more revolutionary sides of movements by keeping hope in reform alive. Pacifist collaboration with Big Bad blinds them to the defeats that look like victories, like when one government is replaced by another, but nothing fundamentally changes. Cough, cough, hint, hint. For stuff to fundamentally change, folks will need to get rid of governments, capitalism, white supremacy, and patriarchy. Governments, because they're aggressive and dominating by nature. Capitalism, because it's built on endless accumulation, environmental destruction, exploitation, alienation, and the enclosure of commons. White supremacy, because it's the vehicle for oppression of billions across the globe and patriarchy because it's the oldest beast of them all and plagues everyone's closest social relationships. No revolution in our modern history has completely gotten rid of all four, though some have definitely come closer than others. Nonviolence is also statist because it's so open for recuperation. Businesses and politicians convince activists to make demands, enter dialogue, reform the system, play politics, and make some money. Hippies become flower power brands, workers' movements get caught up in the web of electoral politics, activists become Instagram influencers, environmentalists resign themselves to recycling drives, indigenous peoples enter Congress, activists secure police sensitivity training, liberation movements in colonized countries end up creating governments that work the same as the old ones, and movements get stuck in the quicksand of NGOs. And who oh boy! NGOs are a subject I'll be tackling very soon. Pacifists can easily get mainstream publishing companies to pump out their books, 
can secure interviews on mainstream media and can give their expert opinions and hefty institutional resources wherever they go. Boom bap, easy recuperation. It's what happens when activists play by the rules of their rulers and accept defeats as victories. Activist movements will keep getting recuperated unless they form an antagonistic consciousness to the state. Nonviolence is damaging to messaging. Pacifists are really bad when it comes to the media. Of course, they think they look good, but they really only end up hurting the movement. They're so obsessed with keeping control that they go off message when they have the opportunity to be on the news and end up wasting time trying to distance themselves from any violence that may have occurred, or so they could protect their image. So when the reporter says, what do you have to say about the windows that were smashed in today's protest? The nonviolent activists waste the 10 seconds they have on the air to say, our organization has a well-publicized nonviolence pledge. We condemn the actions of the extremists who are ruining these protests for the well-meaning people who care about saving the forests, ending police brutality, stopping the war, and halting these evictions. Waste of time. Activists have a limited spotlight, and they can't waste it going on the defensive. Remember, the number one rule of the media is always stay on message. For example, the reporter would say, What do you have to say about the windows that were smashed in today's protest? An effective activist would say something like, It pales in comparison to the violence of deforestation, police brutality, the war, or these evictions. Corporate media reporters aren't humans, and their editors are usually looking for a way to make activists look bad. So activists should use them as an avenue for the delivery of concise statements that tactfully address issues. They shouldn't come off like they don't know what's up. Nonviolence is patriarchal. Patriarchy is a social system in which men hold a monopoly and exercise both individual and systemic prejudice against women. It falsely divides all people into either male or female, defines clear rigid roles for both, and declares it is natural and eternal. Because of the rigidity of patriarchy, it cannot recognize genders and sexes that do not fit within the strict binary, and thus neutralizes those people with violence and ostracism. Patriarchy is maintained by people of all genders and all walks of life, and most relevant to this video, it restricts violence to the realm of men. Under patriarchy, violence against women and queer folks is normalized, but it enforces passivity, submission, and nonviolence amongst them. They're expected to either quietly take abuse or attempt to flee, turn the other cheek and wait for the divine to intervene. A woman who organizes with other women to beat up her abusive husband, or an NB who kills their rapist, is punished severely, while abusers and rapists overwhelmingly tend to escape consequences. Of course, nonviolence plays an important role in the abolition of patriarchy. Healing and reconciliation are necessary exercises to dismantle such a deeply entrenched system. Modern justice systems are incredibly punitive and patriarchal, borrowing from legal codes that once defined women as property. But just because revolutionaries have to build a culture that is safe, healing and healthy, doesn't mean that those victims of patriarchy, especially women and transgender people, can't or shouldn't learn to fight back. Revolutionaries can't limit themselves to only peaceful healing tactics. Circumstances vary. And no, a woman fighting back is not reinforcing patriarchy. She is disrupting it. And that disruption won't end patriarchy on its own, but it's necessary nonetheless. Even in radical groups, men tend to dominate non-men in discussions about strategy and tactics. However, men would all do well to listen to them and learn from history. Violence isn't masculine. Nigerian women have fought petroleum companies. Kurdish women have fought ISIS. Palestinian women have fought Israeli occupation. Vietnamese women have fought the US. British suffragettes have fought cops. And black women and queer folks have fought the police at Stonewall and elsewhere. Femininity doesn't equal nonviolence. But even when advocates for nonviolence make an exception for self defense, they still let slip their blindness to the daily systemic violence that people have a right to defend themselves against. Environmental racism, for example, is a serious issue that poisons poor black and brown folks, making their breast milk toxic, their water undrinkable, and their lungs cancerous. When writing your stories, ask yourself. Would it be wrong for those people to destroy the factories nearby that are poisoning them? Or should they just endlessly protest while the industrial machine expands into their very bodies? As anarcho-feminist Emma Goldman rightfully wrote, History tells us that every oppressed group gained true liberation from its masters through its own efforts, 
it is necessary that women learn that lesson, that she realize that her freedom will reach as far as her power to achieve freedom reaches. Nonviolence is tactically and strategically inferior. In order to understand the tactical and strategic inferiority of nonviolence, we need to clarify some things. Firstly, violence and nonviolence are not strategies. They are categories under which we place a set of tactics. Tactics are the options for action that flow from the strategy, and the strategy is what flows from the goal. Some people will choose tactics without considering strategy or goal, but activists are supposed to start with their goal. The goal is the destination they're trying to reach for victory. They can have many goals, both short-term and long-term, and focus on short-term goals is important for maintaining action, but they should never lose sight to the destination, the long-term goal that is liberation. Once you understand the goals of your characters, then you can develop their strategy. That's the game plan. A lot of people have a rough idea of the goal and are super involved in their tactics, but don't even have a real strategy. Or if they do have a strategy, they have it for short-term goals, but completely ignore long-term goals. Once your characters have their strategy, they'll be able to develop the tactics, which are the actions to produce results. Activists spend a lot of time bickering over tactics, but few people stop to consider whether their goals or strategies are compatible, complementary, or counterproductive. There are levels to it though. Their short-term goals may be long-term tactics. If they were going to set up a free clinic, that's a good short-term goal. So they figure out a strategy, perhaps an illegal strategy that seeks to avoid government power or force them to cede some autonomy. Their tactics may be squatting, fundraising, and medical training. But if their long-term goal is overthrowing the state, building the clinic would be just one tactic, and their strategy would be building a militant popular movement that's sustained by autonomous institutions. So if we move forward with the assumption that your fictional pacifists and revolutionaries have the same long-term goal, complete liberation, then there's a clear gap between revolutionary activists and non-violent activists. Non-violent activists have far less tactics to choose from, so that's a disadvantage. Their only chance at superiority is in strategy, the way they use tactics to achieve goals. So let's talk about the four major types of non-violent strategy and the weaknesses of each. The morality play, the lobbying approach, the alternative building approach, and generalized disobedience. Starting with the morality play. Put simply, the morality play is an attempt to create change by changing people's opinions, either by educating or by occupying the moral high ground. The tactics of this strategy vary and can be quite helpful. Holding speeches, distributing information, and holding discussions might educate people about oppression or specific issues that might influence them to join a protest or donate. However, this strategy faces three fatal barriers to prevent it from accomplishing anything but small victories. The first barrier is the massive, highly developed propaganda machine the elite control. The machine is so powerful that it can easily decimate, co-opt and water down any ideas and movements that pacifists try to build. Revolutionaries can't underestimate the thought control industry. They're the invisible government that manipulate the masses of this world. And that's not conspiracy, that's the open admittance of the industry. They have the ability to counter, discredit, factionalize, and drown out any threat to their power. They can manufacture consent for wars despite the brazenness of their lies. See, for example, the US invasion of Iraq. Despite the efforts of alternative media, who did manage to get some symbolic protests out there against the war, it took corporate media reporting to finally turn mass public opinion against the war. And only share that information after it became clear that the war was counterproductive to US interests. The endless and total power of corporate media is far more potent than solid, well-researched arguments supported by facts. Alternative media is useful, but it can't be the backbone of the strategy. It will never be able to compete with the billions of dollars poured into corporate media that allows it to reach billions of ears. The second barrier is the structurally reinforced disparity in access to education. Across the board, folks lack the ability to analyze and synthesize information that challenges their core beliefs. Poor folks especially are undereducated and struggled with underdeveloped literacy, vocabulary, and analytical skills. Rich folks tend to be overeducated and use their education to maintain the existing system and are often defensive and skeptical when it comes to the idea that the entire system is rotten. People as a whole tend to gravitate to conventional, familiar information over challenging, radical information. The third barrier is a false assumption about the potency of ideas. There's this idea that remains prevalent, that in the free marketplace of ideas, the best ideas will naturally prevail. However, this fails to account for the people who benefit in their complicity with systems of domination. 
using reason and logic to dismantle their ideas doesn't lead to them saying, oh gee whiz, you got me, I'm a commie now. It leads to them doubling down in their defense of these systems, whether patriarchy, white supremacy, capitalism, or imperialism. Men will beat their chest about the superiority of their gender, white folks will wax poetic about the wonder of their civilization, and rich folks will valiantly defend their right to own real estate above all else. The morality play approach tries to enlighten or shame people, and especially those of privilege, into joining and supporting the movement. But it's highly unlikely to succeed. The structural power and incentives of privilege won't allow it. People with privilege know where their interests lie. Education alone is not going to get most of them to support revolution and destroy the power structures that define and uplift them. If your characters just keep putting radical ideas out there and nothing else, they just leave them open to be recouped by ruling powers. Hence the quick breakdown of abolish the police last year into reallocate some funds into other community services while maintaining and funding the retraining of the police. Education is very necessary for militant movements as it helps explain to those they try to recruit why they've abandoned those legal exclusive means. But such a movement's education is so effective because it hasn't limited itself. Seizing government property is harder to ignore than a peaceful protest. Even if the movement does get a majority, an oppositional but passive majority is going to keep being dominated by an armed and active minority. And when activists start off with that education approach, they're stuck with people who have no experience with real resistance and are still fighting an uphill battle of trying to win hearts and minds without meaningfully disrupting the structures that poison them. Education is important, as revolutionaries need a liberating ethos, but there are still concrete institutions like courts, schools, and media firms that will intervene to uphold hierarchies of power. If they limit themselves to non-violent means, they can't weaken these structures effectively. Perhaps the morality play can work for some very short-term goals, but for the most part, pacifists rely on it to condemn to a dead end, if they even make it there. Next is the lobbying approach, which tries to use popular support to gain influence in the political process. But they'll always be much weaker than the cold, hard cash of corporations. Plus, lobbying leads to a hierarchical and disempowered movement. The masses below to sign petitions, raise funds, and hold signs, while a minority at the top of the organization court politicians and other elites, eventually falling in love with power and betraying the people. In the few cases where a lobbyist is steadfast in their dedication to the movement, they won't get an opportunity to reach those in power, unless they're willing to compromise and sell out. Some groups try to avoid this by not appointing any special lobbyists or leaders at all, but they're still stuck trying to get a system to change itself. And the system is never going to change itself in a way that threatens its existence. Franz Fanon expressed a particularly relevant sentiment. Colonialism only loosens its hold when the knife is at its throat. It is not a thinking machine, nor a body endowed with reasoning faculties. It is a violence in its natural state, and it will only yield when confronted with greater violence. It took the violent persistence of the Zapatistas for them to gain and maintain the land they now hold in control. Even a good government will not give away some power unless it's scared of losing all its power. Lobbying is a waste of scarce time, energy, and resources. Resources that, instead of being spent on legislation or elections, could be spent more effectively on free clinics, free schools, and community support centers. Resources that could be spent building up a real threat to the elite, refusing to be placated and driving a harder bargain than those who try to bargain with authority. When lobbyist movements succeed with concessions, they lose their momentum and seem impossible to satisfy if they try to keep things going. Meanwhile, radical movements never have to limit themselves. Even when they lose, they still manage to secure reforms. The Red Brigades may have lost, but they so terrified the Italian elite that the government expanded social welfare and culturally progressive legislation. Next is the alternative building approach. And what about it? It's actually a decent strategy and necessary for success, but it's only one component. Your activists should be building alternative institutions to sow the seeds for an autonomous society that demonstrates that folks don't need capitalism on the state. But you think real G's can move in silence like lasagna? Not all. The big bad is not going to sit back and let your revolutionaries just lay the groundwork for its abolition. The occupied factories in Argentina, for example, had to either become recuperated into the capitalist economy as worker co-ops, or fight the police and coordinate with militant neighborhood assemblies. And they couldn't expand into factories run by managers because then they'd be in even more conflict with the state. They weren't able to actually replace capitalism because they weren't willing or able to take greater steps. 
They had the alternative, but the alternative alone is not enough. Alternatives are often repressed, like the guy who was building homes for the homeless in Toronto and was sued by the city, even having the homes burned. Or like the Panthers whose free breakfast program was repeatedly sabotaged by the police. The revolutionaries have to be able to protect their alternatives from repression and consumption by the capitalist machine. Without a strategy that includes destroying existing institutions and defending against destruction, they're bound to failure. The last non-violent strategy I'd like to examine is generalized disobedience, which does allow for some property destruction and symbolic physical resistance. Tactics include strikes, blockades, boycotts, and other forms of disobedience. All useful, but the strategy alone still has some key weaknesses. Disobedience alone does create a crisis in the eyes of the big bads, but they're still ultimately in control. They still have the police and the military, and they have a couple options. They can brutally destroy a movement of non-violent barricades, occupations, and sit-ins easily, but that would damage the illusion of democracy. It's a last resort. They can also just reshuffle leadership and call it a revolution, a shift from one hand of the elite to the other. Then the non-violent activists would have just lost the closest opportunity they ever had to achieve real revolution, real power to the people, because they were constrained by just non-violent tactics. Disobedience may shut down some parts of the system, but militant strategies are usually more effective. Blowing up a pipeline does a lot more to the system than just blockading it. In summary, all four major non-violent strategies have their weaknesses. Morality play strategies misunderstand the state and the media. Lobbying approaches waste resources. Alternative building strategies ignore state repression and capitalist absorption. And generalized disobedience strategies open the door for revolution, but are incomplete without more offensive tactics necessary to take things to the finish line. Revolutionaries may not be in a position to advance any militant tactics at the beginning of your story, but strategies undertaken must overcome that passivity and foster that militancy. Nonviolence is deluded. The characters in your fictional dystopia who push so hard for nonviolence are exercising many, for a lack of a better word, delusions. Let's examine those delusions one by one. Uh, violence fails too, you know. This delusion asserts that if nonviolence has failed because its victories are victories for the state, then violence has failed too. Truth is, historically speaking, struggles using a diversity of tactics have succeeded in accomplishing their goals, whether you agree with those goals or not. Revolutions throughout North and South America, France, Ireland, China, Cuba, Algeria, and Vietnam, and struggles for state power aren't the only ones that have succeeded. Anti-authoritarian movements, historic and present, such as in the Spanish Civil War, Magno's Ukraine, Xinjiang Province, and the Zapatistas, have all managed to succeed militantly while remaining anti-authoritarian, though they do face the constant hostility of states. Uh, actually, violence is authoritarian. When pacifists pretend all violence is the same, when they can't even properly define violence, when they decide to take a stand against violence over any forms of oppression, they fall apart. I mean, look, Trying to defend violence really just leads you to one or two outcomes. If non-violence defines itself against anything that causes pain and fear, that had to include eating meat, vaccinating, and giving birth. If non-violence is morally concerned with outcomes, then inaction and ineffectiveness in the face of the big bad's violence is also violent. Either violence is an inevitable part of life, or violence includes failing to end violence. Some point to the violent Russian Revolution leading to another violent and authoritarian government, which somehow means that violence is always authoritarian. Except the Bolsheviks wanted a centralized authoritarian state capitalist system. Lenin himself insisted that the USSR was operating under the last stage of capitalism, called state capitalism. Stalin too wanted a state-run capitalist economy. On their own terms, they were successful at achieving that goal. They did do a lot to industrialize the once feudal Russia. However, at the same time, in Ukraine, anarchist revolutionaries of Makhno's Black Army also used violence to liberate huge areas from the Germans, the White Army, and the Red Army. But they refused power, and instead of imposing their will onto those they liberated, they encouraged them to self-organize. They were betrayed by the colonizing Red Army later on. The USSR and China upheld a hierarchical form of organization. Makhno didn't. The distinction is hierarchy, not violence. Hierarchy cannot be divorced from psychological patterns and social relationships of domination. 
but violence doesn't always produce certain specific psychological patterns and social relationships. Your characters can use violence to overcome structures of power without reproducing them. Violence against the authoritarian big bad doesn't automatically make your characters authoritarians too. Don't get force and authority mixed up like Engels did. As Franz Fana noted while working in a psychiatric hospital in Algeria during their fight for liberation, violence is a cleansing force for those who are ground down and dehumanized by colonization to liberate themselves. To truly succeed, a liberation struggle must use any means necessary that are consistent with building a world free of coercive hierarchies. Uh, a violence is the easy way out. There's this idea that if revolutionaries choose violence, then they're taking the easy way out. But those who choose non-violence actually have it much easier. During the Black Liberation Movement, many activists knew they'd end up either dead or in prison. Some are still in prison, or in exile, or pacifists awaiting book deals and pats on the back. Pacifists have given their life to the cause before, but usually they can always go back to a comfortable life. They can always save themselves through compromise. Not so for revolutionaries. Revolutionaries aren't just acting from impulse, irrationality, or anger. In fact, they're usually far more well-informed of the structures and systems that run society. They're often well-versed in literature and share their knowledge with those around them. George Jackson, for example, educated himself in prison and emphasized the importance of black folks studying their historical relationship to their oppressors. The Panthers had reading requirements for membership. New African anarchist Kwasi Balagoon, upon being brought to trial, rejected the legitimacy of the court in a stunning statement. Before becoming a clandestine revolutionary, I was a tenant organizer and was arrested for menacing a 270-pound colonial building superintendent with a machete, who physically stopped the delivery of oil to a building I didn't live in, but had helped to organize. Being an organizer for the Community Council on Housing, I took part in not only organizing rent strikes, but pressed slumlords to make repairs and maintain heat and hot water, killed rats, represented tenants in court, stopped illegal evictions, faced off city marshals, helped turn rent into repair resources and collective ownership by tenants, and demonstrated whenever the needs of tenants were at stake. Then I began to realize with all this effort, we couldn't put a dent in the problem. Legal rituals have no effect on the historic process of armed struggle by oppressed nations. The war will continue and intensify. And as for me, I'd rather be in jail or in the grave than do anything other than fight the oppressor of my people. The new African nation as well as the Native American nations are colonized within the present confines of the United States. As the Puerto Rican and Mexicano nations are colonized within as well as outside the present confines of the United States. We have a right to resist, to expropriate money and arms, to redacted the enemy of our people to redacted and do whatever else aids us in winning. And we will win. Meanwhile, pacifists have simplistic cliches. At least revolutionaries know what they're getting into. Uh, we fight back non-violently? Pacifists who want to seem tough claim they do fight back, but non-violently. Sitting down and locking arms isn't fighting back though. It's a nice photo op, but Meek resistance only makes it easier for the bully to keep bullying. Actually fighting back raises the cost of oppression incurred by the oppressor and makes the big bad foot soldiers think twice about brutalizing a battle-ready crowd. And non-violence isn't revolutionary because uwu society has always been violent. Society honors both pro-state violence and respectable dissent. Society loves Gandhi and hates the Panthers. Uh, but the state is decent though. Pacifists really think the state will be noble and decent, and that their privilege is going to protect them. In Tiananmen Square, students thought their government wouldn't open fire on peaceful opposition. They believed they could negotiate with the party bureaucracy, which left them defenseless and strategically inert. They didn't arm themselves and they got rolled over by the tanks of the People's Liberation Army. Same thing at Kent State. They didn't arm themselves and the government that was massacring millions in Indochina didn't even think twice about killing a couple of them. MLK Jr. said that those who make peaceful revolution impossible only make violent revolution inevitable. Pacifists can't overcome matters where rulers just don't want to compromise. Violence is alienating. Not really though. People love violent video games and movies. I mean, that's why I'm doing this video. I want you to be able to write realistic revolutions in your fictional worlds. 
I mean, even wars pursued on false pretenses get some support. Meanwhile, candlelight vigils are alienating to those who don't participate. Voting is alienating to those who know it has little impact on their material conditions. Loving thy enemy is alienating to people who recognize the depth and intimacy of love. Pacifism is alienating to millions of poor victims who quietly cheer when the big bad's foot soldiers occasionally get wiped. The real question is who is alienated by violence and by what kind of violence. Reckless violence that puts people at risk and isn't effective definitely alienates people who already suffer under violence. The revolutionary shouldn't act prematurely, with tactics no one else can understand or support. But that doesn't mean they can capitulate to the big bad controlled mainstream. It just means they'll need to cultivate sympathy in their fight for survival and freedom. A lot of pacifists assume that people who don't participate in social movements are just apathetic. Truth is, a lot of people see organizing that revolves around peaceful protest, with the big bad's permission, as a pointless exercise that won't accomplish anything. Nonviolent theory is a tower of delusion. It has never worked and has never existed. We're all soaked by violence, from the taxes we pay to the vehicles we drive. Those who suffer under it either fight back against their oppressor or turn their violence towards their family, their neighbors, their community, or themselves. Peace is an illusion. There is no way in your fictional world that is peaceful while the big bad still exists. Your world cannot heal until the big bad no longer exists. The big bad is in constant war, and there is no neutrality. So how can your fictional revolutionaries avoid the same traps of history? What can they do to get at the roots of oppression? How can they get over their cultural conditioning that sees attacks against the big bad as just as bad? How can they avoid serving the big bad and its brothers? How can they avoid recreating authoritarianism? Glad you asked. When your characters are organizing for liberation, anti-authoritarianism must be reflected in both their organizations and their ethos. Power and decision-making should be decentralized and grassroots, so no political parties or bureaucracies can develop. Communities and groups should have as much autonomy as possible, federating when necessary to coordinate. It would be difficult, because you have to consider how they coordinate, pool resources, and plan strategy, but it's important that they prefigure re-liberation. The delegates at federations should be temporary, replaceable, and accountable to the ground-level groups. Otherwise, they'll develop a bureaucratic mindset and pursue their own interests separate from the movement. Also, the movement in your fictional world should be something like a quilt of different groups. No one organization should monopolize. Rather, many groups should overlap, proliferate, and die out when no longer needed. A movement is healthier and harder to co-opt when there are many different groups filling different niches and pursuing similar purposes. And when people are part of many groups at the same time, there's less factionalism and infighting. Plus, you'll get to come up with cool names for all the different groups your characters work in. And what they prioritize can tell your audience a lot about who they are as people. Your revolutionaries should embrace the fact that the struggle would benefit from a plurality of strategies to attack the big bad from different angles. There isn't just one right way to do things. Of course, they should coordinate, but there will never be complete uniformity. Difference is inevitable. Different people have different strengths and experiences and face different aspects of oppression. They're not competition to be repressed, they're allies. This doesn't mean you're a revolutionary, you should be working with groups who have a completely different objective though. They should be working autonomously to destroy the centralized power of the big bad so every community can freely decide how they want to meet their needs. Your revolutionary shouldn't think of violence as a particular stage of struggle. Rather, they should be constantly aware of the repression they'll face and the tactics they'll need to use. They should cultivate militancy, care for imprisoned activists, honor those killed by the big bad, and teach self-defense and struggle in their free schools. They must also accept inevitable interpersonal conflict. Their whole class is of people who will simp for law and order, who will work as the Big Bad's foot soldiers to the bitter end. Revolutionaries can't wait until the Big Bad openly declares war and tries to plow over them. They have to be ready to resist from the very beginning. I spent this whole video taking apart the weaknesses of pacifism, but that doesn't mean you can't have any characters that are pacifists. It just means that while they may prefer peaceful methods, they can't try to control or co-opt the whole movement. They have to be able to accept a diversity of tactics and not, you know, 
rat people out to the big bad like Judas Iscariot. And what about revolutionary leaders? Those are fun characters to write. In an anti-authoritarian struggle though, they shouldn't have institutionalized or coercive power over people. That tends to inhibit people's liberation potential. Rather, people with special expertise and skills should be in a place of non-coercive leadership. That means they're constantly redistributing their power outwards by lending their talents and teaching people their knowledge rather than holding onto it for themselves. Oh, and let your revolutionaries celebrate their successes too. Small, short-term victories, real victories, are worth celebrating in the face of the powerful big bad. Even lost fights are better than not fighting at all, because they empower your characters and teach them that they can fight. Although the workers were defeated, poisoned, and bombed at the Battle of Blair Mountain during the 1921 mine war in West Virginia, filmmaker John Sayles wrote, the psychological victory of those violent days may have been more important. When a colonized people learn that they can fight back together, life can never again be so comfortable for their exploiters. With all that in mind, I hope you're able to write more effective and more realistic revolutionary movements into your fictional worlds. Peace. Thank you for watching. Thanks once again to the family on Grad, Kobe Tamayo, John Vesci, Orishimoni, Len P, and Suavakara Jones. You can join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash true. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your fellow peoples. Feed the algorithm. Check my previous videos for the fascinating topics. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore Thanks again. Peace.